Okay, guys, shall we uh, crack into it? Uh, I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. A very big thank you to ASB who has supported us for putting that on today. And now it is my pleasure to uh, kick off the afternoon. So we have here our GM panel discussion and I would like to introduce Dr. Robin Dines, senior scientist from Ag Research, well known in the ag sector, so she's probably a familiar face to many of you and she is going to be our moderator for the panel today. We are using Slido, so please keep your questions going through there. But first of all, the panel's going to do some introductions. We're going to have a wee bit of a chat first, and then we'll uh, hook into the questions afterwards. So, Robin, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rachel. And it's a real pleasure to be back with the Thriving Southland team again. Uh, Southland is the home to all of my extended family, and my very early years were spent next to the Scandrits at Fairfax and then at Arthurton on sheep and beef properties. Big shout out to John McEwen, my colleague from Ag Research. He's here with the PAC chamber, so make sure you have a chat to John at the end of the day. So it's great to start the afternoon session on GM. We've spent the morning, I went to the drone session and watched the speed at which those drones can move across the country and spray. It's not that long ago, drones weren't part of our world. And yet I think we're on the cusp of where they're going next. We're on another cusp as well, and that's what my panelists are going to talk about this afternoon. The science of GM continues to develop, and it's very different to that science that existed even two years ago. And even, Rachel, when you were at uni and school, it's different. So I challenge you to reset your thinking this afternoon. Genetically modified crops and therapeutics are in use globally. And countries around the world are in the process of, or have already changed their regulations. New Zealand needs the conversation. We need to know our why, why we should be talking about GM, what we should be considering. And we need to know what our future looks like and how we take control of our future. So I encourage you this afternoon to join with me as we welcome three people who bring a lot of expertise and diversity on my far right, Dr. Tony Connor, who is an emeritus scientist with Ag Research. He's a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Ag and Hort Sci and a companion and fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. If you're not sure what that means, it means he's a heavy hitter in the science sector. He's had more than 40 years of um, leading research in crop improvement and integration of these emerging technologies of GM into our plant breeding programs. Much of Tony's research has been on potatoes, but he's contributed to vegetables, arable, flowers. And I think Tony spends quite a lot of his time on gladioli these days, Tony. Is that right? So Tony is the person to talk about plant breeding of many plants. In the centre, Dr. William Rolston. He's the co-founder of a biotech and vaccine manufacturing company, South Pacific Sierra Limited. He's a biotech industry pioneer and that, sorry, this, this company is a pioneer which grew out of diversification of their family farming business, Blue Cliff Station. William was a founding chair of what is now Biotech New Zealand. He's a past president of the Ferrated Farmers of New Zealand and the World Farming Organization. And his service to agriculture and to biotechnology has been represented by multiple awards, including his Companion of New Zealand Order of Merit in 2017. And last but not least, Professor Caroline Saunders. Caroline Saunders. She's from the, she heads the Agricultural Economics Research Unit, which is aligned with Lincoln University. Caroline's research is centred on sustainable well-being, including capturing greater value from our global value chains. And she will bring some real insights into trade and customer and consumer preferences. She's an appointee to the board of the Wool Research of New Zealand the Reserve Bank Monetary Policy Committee, and had a new, was awarded a New Zealand Order of Merit in 2009. And like Tony, she's a fellow of the Royal Society. So to kick off the afternoon, and with Cameron Black in my sights, <coughs> Tony, it's your task, please, to set the scene by explaining to us GE, GM, gene editing, genetic modification. Could you start with an explanation? And when Cameron gives a thumbs up, you're allowed to finish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, thank you, thank you, Robin. 
Look, I just spent a few moments talking about ge genetic modification or genetic engineering are two terms meaning much the same thing versus gene editing, which is a more recent technology, and try and explain the difference of what they both mean. And this is also important because both of these technologies are encompassed by the HASNO Act in New Zealand, so both come under the what is equivalent of the GM regulations at the moment. And what, what, how old is our HASNO Act, Tony? Is that Sorry? A, the HASNO Act? HASNO Act is the act that came into being in um, about 1996 or seven um, to govern the regulation of genetically modification and new organisms in, in New Zealand. Thank you. And it's a, quite a procedure to go through and do field trials and move beyond the laboratory out into field trials and uh, et cetera and into commerce. So the first genetically modified plants were actually developed back in 1983. And the, over the last 40 years, not a lot has changed about the methodology about how we go about it. It allows genes from any source of DNA, even synthetic genes, to be transferred into plants, animals, or microbes. In the case of plants, the genes are first introduced into single cells. Those cells are then selected and then regenerated back into whole plants and it's now possible to engineer virtually any plant species. The ease of achieving this depends on the ability to regenerate those single cells back into whole plants. These genes, through genetic engineering, are essentially asserted at random into genomes. Where the gene ends up can determine how well it will work in the resulting plant. Sometimes the DNA, when it's transferred, is rearranged and does not function <coughs> as you might expect. But once you've developed your plant and have your plant in your pot in the glasshouse, it is possible to characterise those plants using the tools of molecular biology and the modern tools of genomics to fully understand what has happened. So we can determine the sequence of the DNA we've inserted we can determine exactly where in the genome it has gone, right down to the single base pair on a chromosome to where it's ended up. So while we can't control where it goes, we can work out exactly where it's gone afterwards. And we can use the biochemical products of the gene, the RNA, the proteins, and the resulting compounds that are produced <coughs> in the plant as a result of that gene being expressed. We can determine them very accurately and measure them to help us understand any environmental or food safety implications. Mm -hmm. So it does appear GM is a little bit random, but once you've got your plant, you can thoroughly characterise it, determine what, what it might, how it might perform. In contrast, gene editing has been around for about a decade, and it allows the targeting of modifications or editing of the genome that's already there in the plant, or animal, or microbe. The most common approach involves a process known as CRISPR-Cas9, and gene editing is now possible in a wide variety of plants because we now have the full genome sequence of all the major agricultural plants and animals that, that we, we use in agriculture. We now know the full genome sequencing and we can now target any part of that sequence. So what happens in gene editing is this CASPER-CRISP9 complex, this enzyme complex, binds to the DNA at a precise location. And you can direct where it's going to bind by using what we call an RNA guide molecule that mimics the sequence of the DNA you want to target. And once this complex binds the DNA, it cuts it. Then it just disappears, leaves the scene. And other natural enzymes in the plant cell come back and repair that cut. But sometimes they make a mistake and a small mutation will occur at the site of that cut. And this can result in what we call a point mutation where a base pair of DNA is deleted or can be changed. The deletion of a single base pair will delete the function of the whole gene, and it's what we call a knockout mutation. Or the change of a base pair may change the function of that gene. So to give you one brief example that you may be familiar with here in Southland, you'll probably, many of you will know of the clean crop brassica system that's with resistance to the sulfonylurea herbicides. These were developed by chemical mutagenesis, a process that's been used in plant breeding for about 80 odd years in many, many crops. But in the clean crop brassica system, the mutation that was induced caused a single point mutation of a C in the DNA to a T. 
And that resulted in this change of one amino acid in the resulting enzyme that the gene codes for. A change from proline to serine in the amino acid sequence so that the herbicide can no longer bind to its target site. And that's what gives the resistance. The key point here is the identical mutation could be achieved very easily by gene editing. And more importantly, nobody would know the difference. You cannot test for it. So the same applies for any other simple gene editing events. It'll not be possible to determine the origin of that kind of mutation, whether it be natural, induced through chemistry, or gene editing. These simple gene editing events is no, are simply known as SDN1. Gene editing can also be used to make slightly larger insertions or changes or edits, and they're known as SDN2 or 3. Why I say that is I said earlier that the basic methods of genetic engineering have not been changed over the past 40 years, the exception being that gene editing, which can cause a base pair change, can also be used to insert genes. The key thing about using gene insertion through gene editing is you can target exactly where you want to in the genome, and that's been probably the change more recently. So hopefully so, that makes sense. So we've got GM and GE. William, you gave us a great example the other night about the book on the mountains. Yeah, so um, thanks, Jay. That was a really um, good explanation of like um, 50 years of development contracted into about three minutes. So well done. Um, I like to think of um, genetic modification and GE uh, use an analogy because you know SDN1, SDN3s, um, ribosomes, RNA, and all, all, all this are all words that you know fly over the top of my head anyway. Um, so I like to think of, of um, genetic modification, the old style of genetic modification, where you insert a gene. You could think of the genome, the, the genetic code that a, that a um, plant or animal or microbe has, as, as a book. And if you think about that as a book, that's a book that tells, gives you a set of instructions. Um, and um, the old type of ge uh, genetic modification is a bit like having a book on, say, mountaineering and you take a pamphlet on um, snorkeling in Hawaii and you shove it in between the pages. And as um, Tony said, you do that quite randomly. So now you've got a bit of information that might be quite different, put in randomly um, in, the, um, in, the, in the book. And sometimes that might work and sometimes it might not. And it's a bit of trial and error to see whether it does. If you think about gene editing, which um, uh, again, Tony said has only been um, uh, was uh, discovered, in the application, I guess, was invented in, I think, 2014, and actually uh, seen by the science world as being so significant in terms of what we're going to be able to do in terms of biology, that by 2020, um, the inventors uh, won the Nobel Prize. That's an incredibly fast turnaround for getting a Nobel Prize, and it really shows the significance of this. But if you think about um, this book analogy, um, gene editing is like taking your Microsoft Word, putting the book on Microsoft Word, and then using that to change the exact letter in the exact word in the exact paragraph on the exact page that you want. And you can do that either randomly, uh, change the letter randomly, which might not be that useful, or you can actually change it to the letter that you want, just as Tony had, um, had talked about in um, using mutagenesis. Um, so, and, and if you move through those levels, as, as Tony had said, um, just to take that analogy a bit further, you could change the word or you could put in a new paragraph, which would be his SDN1, SDN2, SDN3, which is the, the higher level of, so, of, so of William, how much you put in. Is the point that you can put the paragraph where it makes sense? You can put the paragraph exactly where it makes sense. sense. You can change a, a, a do to a don't, um, you know, so you can switch genes off, for example. Um, I, I think a word about mutagenesis is really worth uh, talking about too, because mutagenesis, as Tony says, has been used for um, for about 50 years to breed most of our most of our crops, um, most of our um, uh, vegetables, etc. So, so William, you're now talking about where we plant out 100,000 plants and look for the one we want. No, it's where you where you either irradiate 
or you expose um, seed or plants to um, chemicals like Thank mustard you. gas that they used in the First World War. And what you do is you randomly create thousands of mutations. And mutations are what evolution is all about, right? But you're doing this at a highly sped up rate. So you're producing a whole lot of random mutations. You don't know what they do, but it's a, it's a plant. You plant them out and you see which ones come up with the, with the solution that you want. And as Tony said, you've got, uh, you've, uh, you've got your clean crop, which is, you know, took a lot of work to identify that that genetic change happened and then to back cross that into the cultivars that are actually useful. So that can take a long, long time. With gene editing, you can go in and in one generation make that change. Use your word processor, if you like, and, and get that result. And the catch with that word processor is we can walk through the supermarket aisles and have no way of knowing. You can read a book and have and no way of knowing, no knowing that, it's, that, yeah. uh, that someone's changed it. And if you think about um, mutagenesis, I think if you take that analogy, mutagenesis is like giving a three-year-old a crayon and leaving them um, with the book for um, <laughs> five hours and just see what turns up. Um, some of it will be readable, some of it won't be. But so, the Word document has the capacity to be better. It has the capacity to be way more accurate, way more and, accurate and be able to do things in a, in a, in a way that is um, uh, firstly much more accessible to people. So the old GM was really difficult to do and, and, um, and meant multinationals were the only people who could afford to do it. The new technologies is going to actually be in our backyards. Um, you know, it's, it's not exactly a, a, in your garage, but it's a lot, lot simpler to do. So it's democratising this um, technology, which was one of the big objections 30 years ago. So I was working as a scientist in Australia in the 1990s when the conversation was about BT cotton. So that cotton uh, was accepted into Australia. It was overwhelmingly beneficial for farmers. It was more profitable, better yields, much lower um, fungicide, pesticide use. So there was many, many positives for BT cotton. At the same time, Tony down the end wrote this um, summary and for the Royal Society of New Zealand, it was published in 1997. Now there are some things here that have stayed the same. Tony will still be at every Crusaders game sitting in his, um, in his seat and at every cricket match that he can possibly attend. So they're still consistent. William, is the science today, did Tony get it right back then? Uh Tony can't speak for himself on this matter, but, um, <laughs> but, but yes, he, he did get it right. And I think, you know, for those of us who are at the Royal Commission, so you'll remember that in 2001 we had a Royal Commission on genetic modification, and scientists got up and said, this is what we think is going to happen. Um, you know, we can't be 100% sure because, because that's science. You can never be 100% sure, but this is what we think is going to happen. And that book um, actually is all about this is what we think is going to happen, this is what we think the science says. And I challenge anyone to find anything in that book that actually isn't true today. So the difference between then and now is that we've had 20, um, almost 30 years of experience to prove that what Tony said in that book in 1996 was actually, is actually um, pretty right. And I want you now, William, to talk a little bit about medicine and health. And in that 20 years, what we have seen either GM or GE contribute I mean, I know about insulin, and yeah. I have family members that stay alive due to insulin, but yeah. tell us about the wider benefits that society has captured. Yeah, so, so I think it, it's worth um, you know, reflecting back. Insulin, insulin is a genetically modified product, and it's, and it's made uh, by inserting a human gene into a bacteria, and then um, brewing that bacteria up a bit like beer, but instead of um, producing alcohol and, and beer flavors, you're um, producing insulin and you then um, purify that. Now, at that time, insulin was, um, the demand for insulin was going up because diabetes was increasing around the world, um, but the supply was really static because you were um, getting uh, insulin from the pancreases of sheep and, uh, uh, pancreases <coughs> of, um, pigs. of pigs and, uh, and cattle. And the problem with that is that's not exactly the same insulin that we, that we have as humans. And so people could be allergic to, to that insulin. So in 1984, Insulin was the first um, GM product that was commercialised. And everyone who's a diabetic now will be using GM insulin. Move the dial along um, uh, you know, 40 years and, and, and add in gene editing. And now we're seeing some of the most extraordinary things happening in medicine. Um, so just to give you two examples 
One is um, using the old style of GM to actually uh, uh, use a, a, a virus as a carrier, so it's, a, a, it's a, an inert virus to carry the, the message into the cells, um, to actually do uh, genetic transformation on people with sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is an inherited disease, it's because of a, a, a different gene, um, and to go in and actually correct that gene, um, people just in the last few years, there have been patients who have actually been cured of sickle cell anemia. Haemophilia is the same. So instead of, instead of having a uh, factor eight that we all have to donate blood for um, forever, um, you can now uh, use uh, gene editing and genetic modification to correct that genetic defect. That doesn't mean that it's going to be inherited. It just means that the, the bone marrow is making um, the, the products that, that those people actually need and they are cured for their life. The other example I'd like to give is CAR T-cell therapy. And this is a new um, ability to treat cancers. And so what's happening, and it's going on in the Maligan Institute in, in, uh, in Wellington, is that people with leukemia or lymphoma, so those blood um, cancers, uh, and there was a very good story about a, um, a uh, comedian, um, a New Zealand comedian who had exhausted bone marrow transplants and chemotherapy and radiotherapy, uh, but he was a comedian and he was blogging. And someone in the States said, why don't you go into this clinical trial? So he went to the, went to the States was part of this clinical trial where they took some blood from him. He was told, by the way, by the doctors that he had, you know, six weeks, three months to live, get your house in order. They took uh, some blood from him. They then uh, purified out the white blood cells. They genetically modified those white blood cells to recognize the cancer. They grew them up in the lab. They then put them back in his arm. He had a flu-like illness for 10 days, and six weeks later, he was in complete remission. That's the sort of power that this technology has, and we're sitting right on the dawn of that sort of technology. If I just uh, make some comments and set some scene about um, what's going on in, in uh, agriculture around the world, you've given an example of BT cotton. You know, the first genetically modified crops were, um, were deployed in about 1996, and, and now today there's 190 million hectares of GM crops grown around the world by something like uh, 30 to 60 million farmers. There are a lot of small farmers around the world. Uh, but this technology is actually accessible to small farmers. You don't need to be able to afford the sort of equipment that's sitting in the back here to be able to use genetic technology. It's totally scalable. Um, and so those first crops were very much um, uh, for agronomic benefit. So they um, had um, you know, disease resistance or um, herbicide resistance. And the thing about them for New Zealand was that actually we don't, we don't grow a lot of corn, or the corn we do, we're not, we don't have corn, uh, European corn borer. Um, we don't grow cotton. We don't grow soybeans. We don't actually grow those uh, or need those crops that were developed early. But now, um, with, particularly with gene editing and the, and the plethora of, of different applications that are coming along, you know, we have some real issues in, in New Zealand. We have challenges, should I say, in, in New Zealand about in, in terms of climate change, in terms of and that's adaptation and mitigation, in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, animal welfare, um, in terms of water quality, uh, land use, etc. So we can use this technology to actually start to breed those um, plants and animals that are going to actually make a big difference and help us meet some of those challenges. And I think that's really where we're sitting now at the moment and why we need to and think about changing the legislation. William, going to get Carolyn to comment around trade and consumers and then perhaps yep. want, we've got a lot of questions coming in, want to come back at the end. If we don't, if we choose to stay GE, GM free, if that is even possible, Tony, which I don't think it is, unless I stay around the outside of the supermarket. Um, what's the risk of getting left behind? We will touch on before the end. But first, Caroline, we've heard a lot about the science, the GMGE. I've got my word processor sorted. I think you probably have too. Um, and I can see we're lucky if we get the pamphlet and the right page in the book. But we've now got the word processor. We've got real accuracy in what we do. Caroline, what about the trade? What about we've been proudly GM-free New Zealand what does the rest of the world think? Do we actually have an advantage from being GM-free now, but also looking into the future? 
So, I mean, um, thanks for the invitation, and I think it's magic this is happening, and I think it's time for a new conversation. And it's not just a new conversation with you guys. We need a new conversation with the New Zealand public, social licence to operate, and our consumers. And our customers I, and consumers? Our customers and... Thank well, you. Yeah, customers and consumers. Um, because, as William and Tony have pointed out, GE is very, very different from GM we were talking about 20 or 30 years ago. And so we've done a lot of research looking in market at different segments and that kind of thing. And sure, at the moment, from our previous research, we can show there are markets that show premiums for GM, GE free food. But with the new GE and the new regulations coming in around the world, you won't, you know, there, there won't be that distinction. They're talking about different tiers of regulation and GE will come to be released in most of our trading partners. So you don't, won't have that distinction. You might still get some resistant to GM, but as I said, that's not quite the future for our food and where our food's going. The other one that I think William really picked on, which is really, really important, if we're talking to um, our social license to operate, the general public, the consumer, the customer, whoever, we have to show them it benefits them. It has to do something that they um, value. And so I chair a genoendophyte group that's going to reduce staggers. Well, we're going to try and sell that. I'm not sure how well it, you know, people overseas will understand that. But that is a benefit, an animal welfare benefit. Tony and Ag Research, they're working on the ryegrass, I mean, ryegrass which will reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to start telling the stories. And what's worrying me a little bit, as I'm talking, we, there is the risk we're going back into our boxes and our corners with some saying, oh, general public should get over it, they don't understand and it's going to come, rather than listening. So I really welcome occasions like this where we can talk. I'd really like to see more occasions like this and get out and talk to the New Zealand public and our consumers. Thanks, Caroline. We've got a couple of questions coming in. How much? Just, just before, just before quick, you do. Quick answer. Yep. <clears throat> Is the mic on? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's really important uh, as well to, uh, because there's, there's this talk about GM free, and Caroline's absolutely right. There are premiums for G, GE free GE products. GE free or GM free? Both. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay. So, so, so uh, because, you know, under the non GM banner, <laughs> yep. non GMO banner, um, gene editing is included as a GMO. Okay, thank okay. you. But, so there are premiums, but there are also premiums for some GM products, and I'll give you two. One is the um, Impossible Burger, which was selling for at least twice the price of a normal burger, proudly genetically modified um, uh, production. And the other is um, a BT eggplant in Bangladesh, which, um, which is seen as being spray-free or reduced spray and, and seen as being a, a real advantage. So, so that's, that's the area around GM, uh, a GM-free product. But the debate we don't want to get confused with is, should New Zealand be GM-free? Or should we be able to have GM-free products? Those are two totally different debates, and it comes down to coexistence, and we'll probably talk about that a bit later on. But are we GE-free now? Well, the answer is no. I mean, most of our cheeses are made with GM enzymes, um, and we are actually able freely to import uh, genetically modified uh, meal and um, soya meal and cottonseed meal to feed to our animals. And, and that, doesn't have, that doesn't make them genetically modified. So, so are we GM free? Um, no, we're, we're not GM free now. Um, and we've had 10 releases of GM in New Zealand as well. Uh, Caroline, how much value is there in the marketplace by remaining GE free? So you've both made the point, there are some markets which are a premium for GM, GE mm -hmm. free. Any sense of how important that is? Well, and I think I'm going to ride this with, remember GE, we probably won't have a distinction. That'll be like GE free. Is that making sense? Yeah. And I mean, I wrote some figures from old surveys, we, um, surveys we've done sort of over the last few years. We, in Apples in California, the consumer segments that pay 100% for GE free. I'll, maybe I should change that to GM free because it's the new one. Uh, beef in Beijing, similar amounts. So the, the different um, targets and different markets, um, B, UAE, beef, 40% in the UK between 10 and 20%. So that's some of the values that, and you know, beef and lamb, 
I think one of the things we have to mention is beef and lamb has definitely put the hat on GM free. You know, so we, discussions have to be had about where they're going with that, and the same with our big mark, you know, the big frontiers and those companies. Um, about it's not the science in, in those organisations, it's the marketing position they've taken. But if you look at um, Australia, for example, and it's a really, I think it's a really good example. So some states in Australia were GM free, and uh, some they didn't grow cotton, by the way. Cotton didn't yeah. matter to their economy, correct? No, they did not. They didn't. They didn't grow cotton, but also canola. True. And and so um, the, the example of canola. Uh, Tasmania are, are still GM free. New South Wales is not. The price for GM free canola there is a premium, as Caroline pointed out. There can be a premium for GM free. The price premium for GM canola, GM free canola, is the same in. Tasmania as it is in New South Wales. But, the, but um, there's no, uh, so there's no extra premium for, a, for the whole state, for a whole okay. state to be GM mm -hmm. free. That, uh, that's the point, right? Right. We're now going to fast go down through some questions. How will GM affect the cost of living in New Zealand and how will that affect the profits on farm? Caroline, you've got 30 seconds. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, it, 30 seconds, wow. It, might, it would pro might bring it down, the cost of living, the, the price of food within New Zealand, but there is a perverse reaction. If you reduce costs on farm, um, we found in early analysis, that can actually cause prices to fall, particularly if we're influencing world prices such as dairy. So That's cost a very of unhelpful down. answer. But at, the, but, at, well, but at the same time, if we're not using that technology and prices have been driven down overseas by that technology, yeah. Then, then we're going to have to work that much harder to create that premium in order to, um, to do it. And in terms of on-farm, GM is likely to reduce the pros cost, cost of, production, of production, production. Which is yep. what we've certainly yeah. seen with canola. So the and profitability yeah. thing is likely to be more profitable. Tony, is the technology developed enough to accurately edit animals? Sheep and beef. There's no difference. Any alter it's, it's as accurate as in plants as in animals. Um, and it can be done in animals, mm. Mm. Yeah. including cooking cattle and sheep. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and in fact, they're doing it in um, human medicine, where you only get one chance to get it right. You know, the, the barrier to entry for doing a medicine is way, way higher. Mm. Um, so gene editing is being used in medicine. So it's been used in medicine. It can be used mm. in, in animals. Um, and, and the advantage with the animal, if you're doing it in the breeding line, and, and I suspect that most of you who are uh, uh, farming livestock in 10 to 15 years' time, your um, stud supplier will be um, making use of gene editing um, in, their, in their processes. And the way you'll do that is be able to gene edit an embryo and then look at the... Um, look at the you know, read the genetic sequence, read the book if you like, so you'll and make sure you got it right. You can't, don't, don't have that luxury in humans. So you'll be able to accurately do that, determine if you've got it right, and then yeah. breed from it, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when many countries like Mexico are rejecting these technologies to regain seed and plant sovereignty, mm. can you give real-life examples of more profitable farming? Canola, cottonseed, soybean. Yeah. Uh, Mexico, yeah, we'll, we'll see how the Mexico um, uh, uh, situation uh, turns out. Um, but um, if you think about corn, um, over the last four or five thousand years, we've actually turned uh, what was grass into corn. Um, you know, we've turned uh, wolves into chihuahuas. We've done a huge amount of genetic change um, just through, through conventional, conventional breeding, breeding. O yep. over time. Um, I you know, we are seeing countries um, move away from um, regulating and stamping, you know, trying to be GM free. And I think Mexico will probably um, make that decision <coughs> themselves. Any, any examples, Tony, or, or from any of you, greater farmer profitability, but include the unintended consequences and environmental degradation from GM crops in the answer? I am not aware of 
any that you could specifically say were due to GM per se. Yeah. Um, there are issues with things um, becoming an issue that are just due to the way the practices are on farm. Sure. So while there might be some issues around herbicide-resistant mm -hmm. GM crops, the same issue applies to herbicide-resistant crops developed by mutagenesis. So it's not the GM per se. And continuous, continuous row cropping, whether it's GM or not, will lead to environmental degradation. Yes, yeah. mm. and, and I, I think it's really useful you know, to talk about having the debate. I think in the last 10 years, we've seen scientists like Tony um, coming out and starting to give some real life examples of GM. It's, that this unintended consequences thing is sort of quite sort of nebulous. And uh, you know, GM, unintended consequences, etc. You know, nothing's risk free. But when you start looking at actual examples, you can start to look at what some of the unintended consequences might be. So, um, you know, the, the high lipid ryegrass that Tony's been um, in, involved with, you know, you can actually look and go, well, if that's going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by, by, um, in animals by, you know, 15 or 20 percent, you know, what are the trade-offs um, for that? Is it going to... Um, is it going to become a weed? Why would it become a weed? And you can actually start looking at those specific examples and suddenly those unintended consequences actually tend to disappear. Look, I think sometimes, sometimes some products have been withdrawn because they weren't a commercial success. Mm. And that happens with some GM products, but happens all the time in plant breeding. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. And, and we, we breed plants and we put them out into the farming community and then we leave them to figure out, I think of Balanza clover in Western Australia, you know. It was a great success once the farmers figured out how to manage it, but we didn't do that, yeah. So the, the National um, uh, Academy of Sciences in America did a, about a 600-page report um, maybe five years ago looking at unintended consequences of GM crops. They didn't find as much as a, a headache um, in terms of unintended consequences. So, so Caroline, our, our two biophysical scientists to your right are making it sound like we've got a great future, GE is going to unlock a lot of potential. Um, markets are growing rapidly, wanting the attributes from New Zealand that include GE free. How do benefits, how do benefits behind the farm gate if we sacrifice the golden goose? Are we really sacrificing the golden goose, Caroline, or can we have it all um, from a trade perspective? I mean, I think GM's a, a bit of a fuzzy one. GE, no, because I, I think that's gone. You know, the international regulations, it's going to be accepted across as equivalent to GE free. But I think we, we've got to have the conversations. We can't, we've got to have the conversations within New Zealand. We've got to have the conversations overseas. Otherwise, we might end up with a, what is it, kickback. Um, because the previous GE discussions did get quite... Um, fraught at times, and we know there are people out there in New Zealand who are very anti-GE. We're not even opening up the debates to say, okay, let's talk let's about this yep. and um, evidence-based um, and sort of to foreshadow any kickback that we might get. I, I think it's, uh, it's important to, um, I guess, reassure people, uh, because there'll be people out here in the audience going, well, if the genie's out of the bottle, then I'm, I'm, my GE-free status is going to disappear, uh, et cetera. So I think there are two points. One is, one is, are we actually getting a premium for the perception that we are GM-free? And, and I remember asking the previous Minister of Agriculture why, um, when Australia were um, you know, killing the Great Barrier Reef with, with nitrates, were draining the Murray River of water and were um, using GM in practically the whole country, uh, were they getting uh, a premium, which the Beef and Lamb Report said, for their um, meat over us? Um, it, it, it doesn't prove the opposite, but it, it does say that you're not going to get a discount. But the other thing I think it's really worth pointing out is that we require GM-free corn seed to come into New Zealand. We got, there's no tolerance. It's 100% GE-free corn seed. We get that corn seed from the USA, where more than 95% of corn is genetically modified. So the question is, is not about, am I going to get, um, you know, am I suddenly not going to be able to be GM free? It's, it's, am I going to be able to sell my product as GM free in the market if my neighbor is using so this GM? Is coexistence. And that's about coexistence. Yep. And that's a really important conversation that we need to have. Both internally and with our trades 
Caroline. Yeah. 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 Tony, how easy it for, is it for a GM crop to affect the paddock of non-GM next door? It all depends on the crop and the rate of, I'd say, pollen movement. But yes, pollen can move from one paddock to in the other, directions. as we always know. Mm -hmm. It can go in both directions as well. It can come back the other way and potentially spoil the purity of a GM crop. Um, but look, our farmers have dealt this with seed production for, for eons. Mm. I mean, all through Canterbury, they can deal with growing pure seed crops of particularly brassicas and carrots, etc. And they have a great plan of how to go about it mm. and, and so they don't cross-contaminate each other. So it's just about coexistence and understanding what your neighbour's doing and talking to them. So Hamish, is yeah. coexistence going to be acceptable in the trade markets? You need to come back and help us with that one. Um, what is the me. impact of GE on biodiversity? Well, that's like saying what's, a, what's the impact of um, modern agriculture or any animal or plant on biodiversity. It depends entirely okay, on no the Okay, no answer plant. from William. No different, no, different of, no different from any other form of agriculture. To any other form of agriculture or any other form of plant breeding. Um, how do we stop big ag controlling farmer benefits using ownership of the cultivars? We reduce the regulation so that more people can use it. So more, more in the market. Tony? Yeah, I kind of agree. Yeah. At the moment, small players can't operate. If GE can't be traced, then what prevents the technology being abused or used without notification? It was said earlier, tech will outrun regulation, and I must admit, I do wonder this as I stroll down the aisle and look at the processed foods list of ingredients. William, is it, it already there? And it's it, it, it is already there. Um, I, I think that it's likely, well, around the world, gene editing has actually been deregulated, so there is going to be no way of tracing it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, what stops people doing nefarious things now? Um, you know, someone could import foot and mouth disease into New Zealand if they really, if they really wanted to. Well, they could but export our gold kiwi fruit to China. Well, they could export China, it. I mean, the, you know, so, so I think, uh, I think those things happen at the margins. Um, it, it's not going to be, that's not going to be our big, big problem. Big problem, yep. Uh, there's a couple of questions here around, um, is the genie already out of the bottle? Is there any way back to natural genetics? I've heard natural genetics, we've been exploiting mutagenesis, among other things, for longer than even I've been alive. So it, the genie was out of the bottle a long time ago. Uh, and about, we've got more about, benefit. About 10,000 years ago, when we first started doing agriculture, the genie was out of the bottle. Thanks, William. You can be relied on for popping that bubble. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> can we approve and use GM technology tomorrow or is there a lag? Uh, no, there is definitely a lag. If we had GM plants ready to, ready, ready to grow now, and they were coming out. We might have. We might have, yeah. but, yeah. They, but they need to get out there into the yeah. breeding programs. At the moment, we can't do that. And it still might take several generations of more plant breeding to bring it to a fruition of a, of a cultivar, and then you've got seed multiplication to go. And that could be another three or four or five years. Um, you know, is this the problem Zealand? with these plant breeders? We ask for a quick solution to a big problem, and they say, <laughs> oh, 12, 14 years? <coughs> well, well, did you say seven? Yeah. Well, well, that's the Gino and the fight. We're, 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 we're trialling in Australia. And so if you said go, but as Tony would say, it would take three or four years to get the seed bulk up. But just to give another example about um, GM, which is actually being used in New Zealand now, but not, not able to be... Um, uh, deployed is uh, that plant and food have turned off the flower, uh, turned off a suppressing gene for flowering. The, the effect is that um, if you're um, apples, for example, you can now get apple trees to flower within months rather than taking seven years. So what they're doing is they're turning that gene gene off, having the um, plants flower within months doing a normal breeding program and then breeding the GM gene out. So you, you speed up your production, your, your uh, genetic gain by, by seven, seven years. years. But you know, the other thing is, is what have we missed along the way? Yeah. I mean, we did have potatoes yeah. with tuber moth resistance 20 years ago. The point is you have to start again now because the cultivars the genes were in are no longer growing.
Can you tell that he's still sulking about his 20 years ago <laughs> research that he couldn't do anything with? And I mean, it does, because we grow a lot of potatoes in Canterbury and we've got lots of issues with having enough ground, seven year rotations and all of the rest, because we've never had an opportunity to try a technology to give us some of those advantages. Well, Lincoln University in 1992, I think, was the first group to produce an increase in a production trait in an animal. They targeted a growth hormone into uh, the wool follicle and got a 7 or 8 percent increase in wool production. <laughs> now, while, well, well, you know, yeah. that, that might not yeah, seem on, like hang a, on, hold that it. might not seem like a, a, a good thing to do now. <laughs> but just think, if we'd had 30 years of understanding the wool follicle and how to manipulate it, we wouldn't be growing the wool we're growing today. We'd be growing wool that people wanted to buy. So all and of our that's Romneys, a huge lost opportunity mm. for all of you. All of our Romneys would have been at 21 micron. If that's what we needed. If that's what we yeah. wanted, yeah. Now that, yeah. Right, back to the questions as we run down our time. What is the danger this technology will let proteins be made in the lab, not on the farm? I'm sorry oh. to the questioner. That bus has already left the station, yeah. 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 and that's not GM. And that is a, that, when I finished um, as president of Federated Farmers, that was one of the key messages that I was making was that actually we've got to get on this bus because we have to compete with those sorts of products. And if we don't drive down our environmental footprint using new technologies, then actually we're going to be left completely behind. Thank um, you, William. Tony, examples of GM technology that could directly help me on farm if New Zealand allowed it. Ag researchers, GM ryegrass, ag researchers, high, 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 high condensed high. tannin clovers. High condensed tannin clovers, that's two. Yeah. Low endophytes. Low end Gene, fight. Yeah, the endophytes, no staggers. Um, endophytes on cereals? Um, doesn't need to be GM. Doesn't need to be GM, thank you. Uh, pest, pest control, um, for, uh, gene drive and pests. Will we control um, possums, William? Mm, not got there yet. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> we haven't yet. got yeah. there yet, no, <laughs> but, but, but We possum. could, um, uh, you can actually now poll cattle um, in one go rather than having to back cross your elite herd. Pole cattle in one go. Sorry, yeah. I missed the start of that. Yeah, Pole cattle in one gene go. Editing. And we're going to need to sort out some of these challenges to keep market access, aren't we? Things like polling cattle. Yeah. Uh, is there a risk to New Zealand tourism income if we move to GM? Well, right now I'd like a few less tourists on the road, so... <laughs> No, I don't. Did think I just so. say that? Um, <laughs> no, I did. Yeah, Caroline. No, Caroline, I don't think so. To, no, to I don't tourism. think um, a tourist comes here because they GM, not um, GM. Yeah. How, how, how many people avoid Paris because it's run on nuclear power? Not me. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody even thinks about it. We don't think about it. You're right. No. We do. We do notice the nuclear power plants when we drive past. Yeah. Um, has work been done to understand the relationship, please, Tony, between GE organisms and the wider ecosystem? Transference, cycling, negative synergies. Look, I, I think any GM plant, its impact in the environment or in the food systems will be no different than our plants we have from regular plant breeding. The risks are identical. Um, if we release a GM cultivar, does it put at risk our existing cultivars, Tony? No, because I'm full, full confidence that our farmers can produce good pure seed. So have I. Is it possible to have some farmers GM and some not in the same region? I think we've answered ab that, William. Coexistence is part of the future. And uh, the, key, the key to that is around um, tolerance levels. So we talked about non-GM. If you, if you go into the non-GM project uh, in the US, for, for example, Fonterra um, sells into the non-GM project, one of the standards there is that you can't have more than 5% of the feed you give to the animals being GM. It's a 5% tolerance. So, um, so actually, even with ryegrass and clover, that, that's not going to be a problem. Um, I've just handed the microphone to Cameron, and I'm apologising later, Cameron, because I've got the confidence you'll ask the questions people don't want to ask. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. What's missing? What have they oversimplified? What have they made it like, just stop worrying about it? You know, what are we missing? Um, just reading through the questions that you guys can't see, they're up on the screen behind. I think a lot of the concern that seems to be coming up is around how the genetic modification, gen gene editing can transfer between plants. And obviously you're all <laughs> uh, very aware of the plant breeding processes and things. Um, but 
how is that transfer going to happen and um, is the GM thing a wee bit like for an easier example to understand organics where you can have an organic farm beside a conventional farm and still get your organic premiums for your markets. Can you pass that microphone to Hamish for a second sitting in front of you? Hamish, how do you guarantee that the cocksfoot that you grow in your farm is pure? Look, we have, we have rigorous audited um, programs that are in place, globally recognised um, audit standards, and I, I think that the the GM standards would be exactly the same. Okay, and the back to Cam. <laughs> <laughs> right, next Cam. That, that was the thing, that, that picking up, I think it's, uh, there seems to be concern around if GM and GE is allowed in New Zealand, will that mean that no one can fly under the banner of being GM free? And coexistence, William, is the and, answer? And, and the answer is they, they still would be able to. I did a paper for the Grasslands Conference, a farmer paper, um, and looked at uh, what, if I want to use GM, what would I have to do to protect my neighbours? Um, and I had Tony um, peer review it for me. Um, the answer was nothing. Thank you, you William. Know, there, will be some, there will be some pollen going mm. over, but not enough. That's T the question. Tony, uh, the last question is with you. Um, okay, how difficult is it to change the regulation? How what? How, how difficult is it to change the regulation? Oh, we need to change the HASNO Act. It needs to be redrafted. It needs to be redrafted. Caroline, how long is it going to take to get consensus in New Zealand? To get? To get an agreement in New Zealand on the pathway forward. Oh, gosh, I wouldn't know. I mean, it's, you've got the House No Act being redrafted at the moment. What's that going to take? Six months? Uh, a year? So it's going to be introduced into Parliament in uh, December, and yep. uh, first reading, yep. and it'll be legislation within a year. So with, Within a year after that. So we've, our time has come to an end. It's not been long enough. <clears throat> Thank you to my panellists. Thank you to you for the many questions that you've asked to Hamish and, and Cameron for being put on the spot. What we want you to take away from today is a willingness to take part in the conversation. Whatever your views, if you want to continue the discussion, Rachel can put you in contact with any of the panel. It's really, really important you seek out the information and get the questions answered that you need answered so that you can be part of the conversation. Because all of New Zealand needs to be part of this conversation and we need you as the agricultural sector to lead the way with your vision of what New Zealand's future could look like. A word from Tony, one word. No? William? Dawn of the new horizon. <laughs> Thank dawn you. coming over the horizon. <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> Listen. Listen to what people are thinking. Listen to them. Thank you, team. We've started this. I think all of our speakers are going to be here for the next couple of hours. No, we have to drive back soon. Oh. You've got to drive back soon. Yeah. For an you hour need or so. A, for yeah. an hour or so. So look, grab Caroline as she's going out the door. Grab William and Tony and have a conversation. Tony's partner, Jean, sitting down the front, is a global <laughs> leader in this space as well. So we've got some great knowledge. Question them. Thank you very, very much. And please join me in thanking our panel. Well done. Thank you, darling. Oh, thank, thank you. you William. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, thank you Tony. Thank you, Robin. That was awesome. Richard's just on stage thanking these guys with a small gift on behalf of all of you to uh, you know, come and talk about it. As Robin's alluded, it's not exactly a conversation that we're having very regularly. So as you said, I've got their contact details. So if you do want to get in touch with these guys, do let me know. Oh, yep, I'll let Robin squeeze past. And thank you very much to Robin for coming to moderate that conversation because she too is an expert in this space. So it's really cool to have you know, the link joined up.